Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Amen. Stand with me this morning, if you will. It is so good to see everybody back in the house of the Lord. I know others are coming in, but man, you look good today. Turn around to someone. Tell them you look good in the house of the Lord. Tell them that you love them. We can't shake hands. We can't hug each other still. We're closer to that than we were yesterday, but man, it's so good to be back in God's house. It's so good to see you. Amen. How many of you are ready to have church this morning? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We had a wonderful... We had a wonderful leadership meeting yesterday, and it was so good to have Brother Martin and his wife here with us today. You are going to be blessed. Amen. But I love to do this. You know that. I want us to lift our hands to heaven. It's Sunday morning, and we're in his house, but I want us to invite his presence here. I believe his word instructs us to do that, and I believe he honors the praises of his people. So right now, with all of your heart, we want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. God, we invite your presence here this morning. God, fill this place with your anointing, Lord. We're asking you to meet with us here today. God, we need you, we thank you, and we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity. And right now, God, I pray you'll fill this house with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap. Praise God. Worship with the praise team this morning.
Yes, we'll dance in your presence until you come again.
Come on with all of your heart. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. That song has a powerful message. We do face a lot of obstacles and a lot of problems and a lot of trials and a lot of things we do not understand in this world. But if you can get to a point where you're not afraid, if you can get to a point where you trust him, then you can wait on him. Then you can allow him to work and allow him to move. Can we give the Lord another good hand clap in Jesus' name this morning? Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready to receive our Sunday morning tithe and our Sunday morning offering. In just a moment, if Brother Shea will help me and, and uh, Brother Antonio, come up here and help him. Grab both those offering plates for me, Brother Shea. And I'm going to get Brother Antonio to help you this morning. But um, we had our leadership retreat yesterday and you can see down here in this little um, poster here we got our theme and uh, we're going to be talking more about that as the service goes on but it is so good to be with you today and, and also before we before we receive our Sunday morning tithe and our Sunday morning offering this morning I want to have a, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and I want us to pray for brother Joe McKnight family we found out yesterday he had a massive heart attack and died um, in, in church just a couple days ago and leading service and I wasn't expected wasn't something they were anticipating and we want to remember that family and that church he pastors at Blue Mountain in, in Blue Mountain Mississippi and I know there's needs all across this this room this morning how many of you have needs how many of you have situations in your life but we're serving a good God we're serving a merciful God we're serving a God who loves us who who, who always has our best interest at heart not many people in this world always has your best interest at heart, but God does. He, he cares about you, He loves you, and He always wants to help you. Amen. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We're going to lift our hands to heaven. We're going to pray for Brother Joe McKnight family. We're going to continue to pray for our country and that this COVID stuff will go away. Amen. We're going to continue to pray for revival in every church across this land. We're going we're gonna to lift up our theme this morning, Let Thy Kingdom Come. We want God's kingdom to come in this church, in this city, in this country. We want, we want his kingdom to come. Amen. We want his people to be sensitive to his spirit. We want his people to obey his voice. Amen. So this morning, lift your hands to heaven. Let's call out on the name of the Lord. Let's pray for Brother McKnight's family and his church. And we're asking God to move in the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. God, today we love you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your people that are here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your church. God, thank you for the truth. Thank you for knowing that this morning we can trust you. We can lean on you. We can depend on you. God, right now we're praying for all those that are struggling during this season of COVID. We pray for Brother McKnight's family this morning. We pray for the Blue Mountain Church, Lord. God, all across this land, all across this country, there's problems and there's trials. But God, we trust you this morning. And we know that you have our best interest at heart. And we're asking you to move. We're asking you to work. God, I pray this morning that you anoint the remainder of this service. Church. And I pray right now, God, that our hearts and our minds will be open to hear your word this morning as Brother Martin preaches to us, to receive your word this morning and to be obedient to your word. I pray that you'll bless this offering. I pray that you'll 
See it for your kingdom, God, and I pray you'll anoint the remainder of this service. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Bring your tithe, bring your offering. Brother Antonio, scoot over just a little bit. Amen. Be careful. Stay as distant as you can. In Jesus' name. Life is over. I'll, I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. Oh, This life have gone. I'll, I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown. I'll, I'll fly away. Oh yes, I'll, I'll fly away. Oh glory, I'll, I'll fly away. favorite verse right here says this and just a few more weary days and then I'll, I'll fly away oh to a land where joy shall never end oh I'll, I'll fly away oh yes I'll that wonderful name of Jesus. I will bless that wonderful name of Jesus. I will bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other. Hey, there's power in that name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in But if you need victory, I dare you to get your hands up right now and just declare it. I declare victory in this place. I declare anointing in this place. I declare life-changing power in the name of Jesus. No other name I know. And you know what else? Oh, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. a few more weary days and then I'll, I'll fly away oh to a land where joy shall never end oh a few more weary days and then to a land where joy shall never end. 
there's a hole prepared where the saints shall fly over in the glory land. My God. Ha-ha. Woo. Ha-ha. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's anointing in this room right now. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> hey, this is what we've been praying for. This sign up here says, let thy kingdom come. Amen. In Bartlett as it is in heaven. In Memphis as it is in heaven. At Fountain as it, We want the glory of God to fall in this place. Hallelujah. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? We are so thankful and so honored to have uh, one of my favorite preachers of all time, Brother Sutton. Um, when I was a boy, Brother Martin... I was like five when he became the national youth president, something like that. I'm just playing. But he was the national youth president for 14 years. And uh, it wasn't long before he became the general superintendent of the ALJC, and he served in that capacity for many years. He is a lover of souls, of people. Amen. He's an anointed man of God. And his wife is here. We love Sister Martin as well. Amen. I tell you what, I, I look around and so many of our, our ladies here have uh, bright flower spring-like outfits on. I believe that's prophetic in Jesus' name. Let it be so. Let it be so. I rebuke snow and ice. But thank you so much, Brother Martin, for being here. Yesterday, he spoke to the department heads of our, of our church. We had a meeting, and he was just amazing. Um, it's, it's not very often, Sister Tiffany, that you have a leadership meeting, and then you have tongues interpretation. That doesn't happen very often. But there was such a deep anointing. Amen. We want him to come right now. We want him to feel his liberty. But what we really want is we want him to feel so much Holy Ghost in this room until he, he we, we want him to be so tired from preaching today that they can't drive back home. That's, that's what we're going to do. Amen. Amen. Would you right now, as he comes, would you raise your hands towards heaven? Let's worship the Lord. God, have your way. God, touch your man. God, you are great, greatly to be praised. God, oh, Lord, we want you. Our desire is you. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. What an honor to be in the house of the Lord. And surely the Lord is in the house. We have felt and feel and acknowledge him today. I'm already tired, Brother Johnson. I hadn't even preached yet. But that just happens sometimes. But what an honor to be in this great church with you wonderful people. And I want to say to Pastor and Sister Johnson, we appreciate them, love them. Uh, your pastor has been a friend to me for many years, and I appreciate his friendship. I also want to say I appreciate... Brother and Sister David Johnson and their their life and ministry and influence on my life as well. When I first started going to church as a teenager, going to camps, hearing Brother David Johnson preach, and some of those messages still remain with me to this day. So you have a great heritage, you have a great uh, past, but I also believe you have a great future. And what God is going to do in this church, in this place, with this people. And you ought to be glad to be a part of it. I said you ought to be glad to be a part of it. You ought to be thankful. And I know you are thankful. Your pastor and the ministerial staff, all of those that work diligently to 
make this church a success because we want the will of God to be done in us and through us in the days that we have remaining. God is great. He's greatly to be praised. And, uh, and the, the spirit of praise in the house is, is wonderful. And it's obvious that somebody in the house knows that God is worthy of praise. Somebody knows God's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be exalted. He's worthy to be magnified. Does anybody have a shout in you this morning, a praise in you? I can't help but say thank you, Jesus. I can't help but say thank you, Jesus. I can't help but praise him, the lover of my soul, King of kings and Lord of lords, almighty God, we praise you in this house this day. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you would just remain standing, I want to read the scripture. I want to say thank you, Pastor, for the great honor to be here. It's my honor and privilege uh, to be with you. Your pastor constantly brags about you and this church, and it's evident his love for you, for this congregation, and for the work of God. And you, you can't ask for a whole lot more than that. So let, let's, let's do the work of God. Amen? Let's, let's do it. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. I, I had something else originally, but... I just felt the moving of the Lord to share this with you today. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, that is, he can't speak. Wheresoever he taketh him, wherever this spirit takes him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. One of the Gospels says it this way, that as he was bringing, as the Father was bringing him to Jesus, that the Spirit threw him down. Which that's what Spirit wants to do. He wants to cast you down. Throw you down. Verse 21, he asked his Father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? He said, Of a child. <clears throat> and off times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, if there's anything you can do, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth <clears throat> and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears Lord I believe help thou mine unbelief when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying to him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Thank God for his word. I want to preach this word to you. I want to believe. I want to believe. Let's lift our hands and thank God for his word, would you, and for his presence right now. Come on, let's glorify him. Hallelujah, Lord, I bless your name right now in this place. I feel the welcoming spirit of God in here. God, I know you're here to visit this people and this congregation. Speak unto my heart. Speak unto my spirit. 
and speak unto this people, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Before you're seated, give the Lord a great hand clap of praise. You may be seated. You can imagine the concern and the horror of this father who has a son who is in desperate need of God, of help, of deliverance. You can also understand his frustration because everywhere he goes to get help, no one can help him. He hears about Jesus and he hears about his disciples and the exploits of casting out demons and healings and so forth. Maybe this is the opportunity. If I can somehow have an audience with Jesus, that he can help me in my dilemma. So he brings his son to the disciples and they could not cast the spirit out. The despondency of the father at this point has to be strong. Because if even the followers of Jesus can't help me, who can possibly help me? No one can help me, my child. And also, can you imagine as a parent, your child needing 24-7 attention because of a spirit in the child that is trying to destroy the child, tears the child. The child is foaming. The child is pining away, just, uh, just into nothing. And then the spirit also takes the child and throws it in the fire to try to burn it. Then it'll throw it into the water to try to drown it. So it's like this, this spirit is just constantly abusing this child, leaving him wounded and broken and hurt. And for the father to see this happening, anything, I will do anything to help my kid if I just know what to do. Don't you feel that way? Yeah. So maybe Jesus can. I said, As I said, the disciples couldn't. But then he cries out to Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, maybe he can help me. Jesus, your disciples couldn't, but can you help me? Because for years we have lived in fear. For years we have lived in a situation of constant horror, tearing, foaming. Notice it says gnashing with teeth. Usually when you hear this terminology of gnashing with teeth, it's in relation to hell because the truth is this son and this father are living in hell because of this condition, casting him in the fire, the water. If you can do anything, and Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible. If you can do anything, if, if, if you can do anything have compassion on us that is Jesus language ladies and gentlemen because if you will notice throughout the scriptures it many times it says he was moved with compassion what moved him was compassion that is the empathy the love in action to to want to minister to people he said, if you can do anything, have compassion. Would you please just have compassion and help us? If you can believe, Jesus said, all things are possible. And it's at this juncture of this narrative that really impacts me. Because the Father is going to say something that's profound and honest and transparent. He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I, as my child, is torn by this spirit. I am torn between faith and doubt. I 
I want to believe. I want to be able to summon up that feeling of God can do everything. But if I, I just need him to do anything, one thing, but I'm having trouble believing. Why is it hard for him to believe in the presence of Jesus? Let me tell you why. Because the Father has lived for years with the daily threat of evil. Imagining the fear, the anguish, the doubt, and the fear that's hovering over him every minute of their life. How can you believe one sentence from a man you have never met in comparison to a lifetime of anguish and pain? Come on now. It, it's not hard to understand why he is struggling. Because if someone speaks one sentence and you have a history, a long, sordid history, how is it that you can just jump on that sentence? Because life says no. No hope, no help. But Jesus says it's possible. So I understand the Father because I am pastor that Father in many ways. I wish I could say I was like Abraham. I wish I could say I was like Moses. I wish I could say I was like David. But I stand before you today saying I am this unnamed man who struggles between doubt and fear. That man, probably more than anyone else in the scripture, exemplifies my life. Can I be honest with you this morning? It'd be great to say rah, rah, power, and this and that, and you can do all of that. But there have been many times that I have been caught in the continuum of faith and doubt, uh, wanting to believe, wanting to grab a hold to it, but then something happens uh, that casts me back down to earth. I don't know about you folks, but sometimes I swing like a pendulum between the two. I wish I had more faith. And I've, woo, I've got faith. And then all of a sudden, I go back the other way. I wish I, wish I could be like that centurion that, that said, Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to come to the house and heal your servant. He said, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the word. I, 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 wish, I wish I had that much faith. And, I, and let me be honest, there have been moments and episodes and times in my life where I felt like I did. But there are also, it, it's, it's balanced with the other times when I have not had that faith that I wished I could have. Jesus marvels at faith. But there's two kinds of faith he marvels at. First, he, he marveled at Jewish unbelief. And he marveled at Gentile faith. Because he says, if anybody ought to have faith, it ought to be the Jews who are steeped in the knowledge of the Scripture. And if there are anybody that shouldn't have faith, it ought to be the Gentiles raised in pagan ways that know nothing about all of that. So if you read the, about Jesus, the only time he's amazed is when the Jews couldn't believe and when the Gentiles could believe. He, he marvels at it. He marvels at it. Faith should reside in me. I've been in church a little while, and so I, I should have faith. Pastor, I should have faith. I should be able to walk around with great faith all the time. Maybe you do. Maybe it's just me. Faith should reside in me. It should reside in you because God has, even as we have, as we have sung, God has been faithful. Has he not been faithful? He's brought you through some things you thought you couldn't get out of. It's a distant memory now, but when you were in the midst of it, you said, I don't know if God will ever get me out of this, but God is faithful, and God got you out of it, and God brought you through it, through the fire, through the storm. God has been faithful to you, to me, to this church, to this people. God has been faithful to us. Thank you, Jesus. You ought to just go ahead and praise him a moment and tell him, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness in my life. 
There's been times that God has anonymously pulled you through things. You couldn't see him or sense him. But God was working behind the scenes to bring forth his glory into your life. And sometimes you didn't even acknowledge him. You said it's just luck. You said it's just coincidence. It was God all the time orchestrating events for your good and for your salvation and your redemption and your deliverance. I want to believe. I want to. I want to. I want to live in that realm all the time. I wish I could. But I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. I don't. I've heard something said similar to this: You shout on Sunday, doubt on Monday, pout on Tuesday, and you're without on Wednesday. When we were all together, it's easy to summon up some faith because it's operating together in a corporate reality. You understand that? But sometimes, it's just not that way. See, sometimes I slip into unbelief. Sometimes I, I default to doubt. That's the automatic default. You computer people know what I'm talking about. It just kind of defaults to doubt. But it ought to default to faith. Lord, I believe. Help, help my unbelief. Why, why is it difficult to believe? The prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah, you're going to die. And when he told him he was going to die, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. He said, please, Lord, remember me. Remember the good I've done. and I'd like to live a little longer. He was so distraught. All it took was a word. You're going to die. He immediately believed it, turned to that wall. Oh, God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Right? The Lord hears his prayer. <clears throat> the prophet hadn't even left yet. He's outside the door, turns around, says, go back and tell him. You go back and tell him, <clears throat> I'm going to add some years to his life. I'm going to add 15 years. Bing, it's like winning the lottery in it, man. He's just... <laughs> One prayer gave me 15 years. I think I might pray again. <laughs> Double or nothing. <laughs> I get some more. <laughs> hey, man, he prayed 15 years. Now that's great. Now remember when, he, when the prophet said you're going to die, he immediately accepted that. Now when he says, hey, you're going to live, I'm going to give you, God said he's going to give you 15 more years. Hezekiah said, how am I supposed to believe that? <laughs> you understand? How am I supposed to believe that? I need a sign. He didn't need a sign he's going to die. That's what I'm saying. We, 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 it's so easy for us to accept the negative rather than the positive. <clears throat> So I, I can believe the negative, but the positive, when you tell me I need a sign, I can't just believe the word. I've got to have a sign. What's the sign? Well, let's come up with something easy here. i tell you what, what I'd like God to do is stop the rotation of the earth. <laughs> cast a shadow which would require to stop the rotation of the earth and move it backwards a little bit. What in the world? You're going to die. Oh, Jesus. You're going to live. Move the earth for me. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the truth? It's amazing. We laugh, but that's us. We've done that. Like Hezekiah, we, we often need more than a word. We want the world to stop. And we want God to focus on us in that moment. Regardless of the struggle inside the Father, he had just enough faith to bring his son to Jesus. And Jesus commanded the spirit to leave. And even as he's being brought, the devil, one last time, one last throw, one last time, He's thinking this. We know we have to go. The spirit knows it has to leave. But before we leave, we're going to do so much damage to this boy. He's not going to be good for anybody. He's not going to be good for his dad. He's not going to have a normal life. We're going to destroy him so badly. We're going to tear him up so badly 
that, that there won't be anything left of him. We know we have to go, but we're going to leave you something so destitute and broken that it will be of no use. And they tried to do that. He did that. He threw him down and did that. Jesus, the Spirit's got to go. They knew it. But Jesus did this. He took him by the hand. Hear me. He took him by the hand and he lifted him up. One of the Gospels says that he touched him and he healed him and he gave him back to his father. Let me tell you what Jesus did. He didn't only cast the demon out. He took the boy. And I believe when he took him by the hand, every scar was gone. Every memory was gone. Everything he did to that boy was gone. And he said, here you go, Father. Take this boy. This boy is whole because I will not let this spirit of infirmity destroy your boy. And what he's trying to do to us this morning is to lift us up, lift you up, lift me up. He loves you and me and us. I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Can you imagine this father when this happened? How overwhelmed with joy he was. Because even when this happened, the Bible says when the spirit left, they all thought he's dead. Jesus said, no, not dead. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I think we'll just say thank you, Jesus, just for a moment, could you? Thank you, Jesus. 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 A year ago this month, one year ago this month, I had a bout with doubt and fear. On February 4th, a year ago, my middle child, Noah, 16 years old at the time. And I'm going to do this the best I can. I'm sorry. He goes to Central Private School there in the Baton Rouge area on the basketball team, plays basketball. We're playing a game at Southern Lab. Central Private is predominantly white. Southern Lab is predominantly black school. And uh, we played them in basketball. And just so you know, we didn't do very well. They were much better than we were. Matter of fact, we did horrible, horribly. Played the first half. My son played the entire half, went to the locker room, as you do, to prepare for the second half beatdown that would follow the first. And as we're sitting there, a young player comes to me, and I'm sitting with the crowd, and he comes up and he says something about Noah, and I thought he said he needs some water. So I said, does he need water? He said, what he was saying, he's having a seizure. He's seizing. <clears throat> so I get up and run. To the locker room. And there's a son, uh, uh, the doctor has a son that plays on the team. He's a physician. He was sitting a little ways away from me. And when he saw me run, and saw the commotion, he got up and ran as well. And we go into the locker room. And at this point, <clears throat> When he was a little child, he had had some seizures. So I was thinking, we're going to have to deal with that again <clears throat> and do what we have to do in relation to that. Excuse me. I usually don't need water. And um, <clears throat> so the, the team is getting ready to leave, and the coach told us what happened, said he was standing there, and then he just passed out, and the players caught him before he hit the ground, laid him there, and he started seizing, convulsing. And then when we came, he had stopped. He was just barely, just kind of moving just a little bit. And the team left to go play. Dr. Dean and I are there with my son. And uh, Dr. Dean says, he's going to be fine now. This happens. And after the, the seizure, he'll, he'll, he'll be fine. He'll just, you know, go, go limp. And I've dealt with that before. He said, let's put him over on his back. <clears throat> so I grabbed his chest. It was just the three of us in the room. And, and I started to move him. And I, and I said, is, is he breathing? 
and he, he checked, and he said, he's not, he's not. He's not breathing. <clears throat> he said, call 911, and he immediately started CPR. And as he started uh, CPR on Noah, I ran onto the court, and I cried out for people to come help. And people began to come out of the stadium to help. And as they came, um, I went back in, and they're doing, the doctor's doing CPR. Someone else has come in now, and they're helping, so the uh, breathing and the compressions are doing all of that. And I just have my hand over on him. And I'm, God, please. Take me, but just let him live, please. Please, just let him live. <clears throat> in a few minutes, there's some people come in from the other team and their fans, uh, different ones come in. One man comes in, he takes his shirt off, gets down, and immediately starts helping. And so people are doing all that, and someone walks in with the AED, a defibrillator, and when he walks in with the defibrillator, they start hooking it up on Noah. And at this point, I'm... I'm I have my hands on him as I said, and I'm praying, and but I'm struggling in my prayers because in my mind, Pastor, in my mind, I start seeing death, and I start seeing a coffin, I start seeing a funeral. I want to believe. I, I want to believe. But all these things are coming to my mind. And then as I'm as I'm doing that. I have to move my hands off, and they, they shock him. And when they shock him, you see his body on that, that cold, gray, damp, concrete slab. His body jumps, when they, and then they have to drag me out, and they take me around the corner. And I'm trying to get back in. They won't let me back in. They're holding me out, and I'm praying and begging. and I don't, I don't know what all I'm doing, but I'm just... I don't, I'm just praying and begging and asking God, please, please touch my son. And then, as I said, I was seeing all these negative things, and then something moved in me, and I began to say, no, in his favor is life. When I passed by you, I saw your, you polluted in your own blood, and I said, live. Yeah, yeah, I said, live. In his favor is life. He is the resurrection life. So what I started doing, I started quoting those scriptures. I started quoting those scriptures and saying, in his favor is life. People are coming in and out with all kinds of expressions on their face. And I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to imagine. And I keep asking, is he all right? Is he, is he alive? Is he all right? And nobody's answering me. Nobody's saying anything. They're just going about. And, and the crowd, as, as I said the team we were playing is predominantly uh, black team. And I'm just saying it to show you this. And about 15 or 20 of the women on that team, the mothers on that team, came down, and they huddled around me. And on the corner of that gym, they started praying. And they started calling on the name of Jesus. They were lifting their hands and saying, Jesus, touch that boy. Jesus, touch that boy. Let me tell you something. People make a whole lot of stuff about race race and all this i'm telling you when it comes down you've got to understand we're all the same and we need prayer and we need help we need the support of god and those those dear people started praying <clears throat> there'd probably never been a prayer meeting on that basketball court before but they were praying and there was one dear precious black lady pastor she came she saw me just wilting and she came and she she grabbed my face with her hands like that. And she said, you look at me. Look at me. And I, you know, I was just confused. Hurt. Look at me. So I look at her and she said, listen to me. Jesus is a miracle working God. Here, here I am. I'm a pastor for crying out loud. But it took a woman in a basketball game in a stand to speak faith into my life when I'm the one that should be speaking faith. But I'm saying, Lord, I believe. 
But help, help my unbelief. Somebody's got to speak some faith into my life because I'm having a hard time. Because I, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. And my wife knows this, that even now if we're watching something, some program, and they do that, and they shock him, I just can't take it. I just can't look at that. Because it's seared in my memory. And, but they were praying. And then the, the coach, the head coach of the other team, you know, the one that was beating us down, he came, he came and put his arm around me. And he started praying. And he told me later, this dear coach, Coach McKnight, he told me, he said, look, my dad raising me up. He said, I'm going to teach you to pray, son, because there's going to be times when you're going to need to pray, and you're going to need to know how to pray. He told me after the event, because we, we still talked, he said, my dad taught me to pray, and all I could remember, hear me now, all I could remember was my dad saying, there's going to be a time you're going to need to pray. And that man prayed. He held me. He held me up, and he prayed for me. He prayed for me. And I was saying, just please, just, I thank you, but just please pray for my son. He said, we are. So you had, you had the white parents and the black parents of these two opposing foes having a prayer meeting on the edge of the, of the basketball court because some things take precedence. Revival and loving people and having church take precedence over things that you think are so divisive. Would you hear me? We've got to love God. We've got to love one another. We've got to have church. We've got to have revival. God does not care about some of the things that you think. This church, thank God for this church. I, I see different types of people and different colors of people, different economic backgrounds of people, different education levels. It doesn't matter. God wants to save everybody. He wants to reach everybody. It doesn't matter. All of those things. He will go to your house and he will minister to you. Hallelujah. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him. Somebody glorify him in this house. God is worthy of praise and exaltation and honor and reverence. I thank God for what he's doing in the earth. What the enemy meant for evil. God's going to turn it for good. COVID can't stop God. Racism can't stop God. Would you hear what I'm telling you? It can't stop nor prevent God. God will turn it all for the glory of his kingdom. God will turn it. For the glory of his kingdom, thy kingdom come. I'm about done, but I've, I've got to go back to the gym just for a few minutes. They wouldn't allow me to go back in. They ended up having to shock him three times to get his pulse back. And they weren't sure how long he had been without breathing. The ambulance finally came, what seemed like an eternity, probably merely minutes. It arrives and they load up Noah. Dr. Dean and I get in. This is the first time I've seen him in a while. We get in. My son can't speak. He's just got a guttural sound that he makes. And he's moving and flopping and they can't hold him down or control him. And they're trying to hook things up. 
at this point, of course, I'm just glad he's moving, right? But <clears throat> we go to the hospital. As I said, he's grunting, his body's resisting, he's struggling, took several of them to time, hold him down and tie him down. Hearing his pain was terrifying as a father. Then the doctor comes in and he says, let me tell you what you can expect. You can expect him to have limitations in motor skills. You can expect him to, uh, his mind not to work right. You expect him maybe never to talk again. So he gives all of this stuff. My oldest son, who's so strong, he comes, he holds me. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right, Dad. The doctor says he may be in a vegetated state. People were praying. <clears throat> and I don't know the time. I guess it's 8 or 9 o'clock or so. They put him in the, in the room, and I, I would in the emergency room, and I, every, so, every few minutes, I would go up to him and lean in his ear, and I would say, I love you, Noah. No nothing, no sound, no nothing. And I would do that every few minutes, Brother Johnson. I would go, and I would, I love you, Noah. About nine, eight or nine, I guess. And then about 3 to 3.30 in the morning, I'd go up there to him, and I leaned down, and I said, I love you, Noah. He said, I love you, too. I ran out in the hallway. I said, he, he spoke. He spoke. He's talking. He said something. I was so excited. So excited that he spoke. Next morning, they take him, transfer him to New Orleans, the hospital there. And then the next morning, it was next morning, wasn't it? The next morning when... He had, uh, in, in New Orleans, the next morning, he has different ones come by. But this, let me tell you what, how amazing this is. I, it must have been maybe 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. He's literally sitting up playing a video game. <laughs> Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. Well, they said... What they said opposed to what God said. <laughs> what they said and then what God said. And we got a, got a picture of me sitting in the chair playing a game with him. And I told him later I, I beat him. Of course, he couldn't remember if I did or not. <laughs> because for a while, for a while, his, his, he couldn't remember from one minute to the next. You could tell, ask him a question, he'd answer, he couldn't answer it, and you tell him the answer, and you could come a minute later and ask the same question. It's like the first time you ever asked a question. Whew, we, we, we prayed he'd get through that, and he has. But my point is, if you can do anything, have compassion and help us. I believe, but would you help my unbelief? The doctor came in. And then another doctor. There was three different doctors that came in. One of them pointed to him laying in the bed and said, Whatever y'all are doing and whoever you're talking to, keep doing it because it's a miracle that he's alive and doing like he's doing. Three doctors said, It's a miracle. It's a miracle. He was in the hospital in New Orleans two more nights, and they released him. It was a Friday night. The team was playing a game, a home game. 
We drove straight from the hospital to the gym. It was the fourth quarter. Now, notice this. The last they saw, the last they knew, we came around the side door, fourth quarter starting. Me and Noah walked through that back door, and when he walks and they see him, everybody's, they could, they look and they could not believe it. And then it was just bedlam. The people, when they saw Noah walk across that gym floor and go sit with his, sit with his team. <laughs> I can't help but say thank you, Jesus. I can't help but say praise God. I can't help but say thank you for touching my boy. I can't help but say I want to believe. And I thank you, Lord, for faith that rises up in our spirit. Let me hurriedly finish the story. It was discovered that he had a hereditary condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a thick enlarged heart and the opening um, is supposed to be like a size 13 and his is like a 40 and it's hard for the heart to pump and, and it's something that you don't know until you have an episode because normal tests don't pick this up. And a lot of athletes and different ones have died of this particular condition basketball players and football players and, and just common people. And typically what happens is when you have that, you don't even know you have it until you have an episode. And when you have the episode, it's 95% fatal because you have to have someone there at the moment doing CPR, and you also have to have an AED, a defibrillator, defibrillation device. If you don't have those there, they die. The lady from the newspaper did two or three different stories on Noah, and she said, I've been writing articles for 20-something years and covered several situations like this, and this is the first time I've ever written the story where the person lived. The TV station came, and they interviewed Noah, and they did two or three di different times of, of talking to him about this particular thing, and they were amazed again, and we were very thankful that he lived, and he had to go later and have a procedure and have a defibrillator in, in his chest wired into his heart in case it ever happened again it's supposed to uh, put it back into rhythm and, and thank God it hadn't had to happen yet at this point but but it but anyway thank God for the miracle of this situation and and I've, and I've got to tell you one other thing I've got to tell you one other thing about that as I said you have to have an AED and most of you you know what I'm talking about it's a defibrillator device and, and you have to have it and hook it up to them and and set it and shock him and all that, put it in the room. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter how much CPR you do, he's going to die with that condition. You have to have something to put it back into rhythm. The school had had an AED before, and they didn't have one for a period of time. And there's a gentleman, the middle school coach, said, we need one at our school. And he started raising money, selling concessions, selling popcorn and candy. And he starts raising, gets up to a couple thousand dollars. He's going to get an AED for the school. We've got to have it. He gets up to a certain amount, and people say, hey, you need to take that money and get new uniforms for the team. He says, nah, I'm raising this money to get a, we need an AED. We need a defibrillator in our gym. We need that. So he raised the money. See, this is what I said earlier about God working back behind the scene. And look, you ain't seen nothing yet. So he's working to buy this defibrillator. He finally has enough money. He goes and buys it, brings it to the school, puts it in his office, listen to me, the day before. The day before, he puts this in his office, locks it in the closet. He hadn't even put it out, set it out yet. This was the very day before. It's locked in his office in the gym. They don't even know he has it. And he's the only one with the key to his office. That night, he had an appointment in Alexandria. He's in his vehicle driving toward Alexandria. He gets a call, the, the meeting canceled. He turns around and drives back to the school, to the gym, 
just to go in. He's not even coaching that night. He's the middle school coach. He's not the high school coach. He just goes in to see how it's going and see how badly they're beating us and all that good stuff, right? So he just goes in, and he's standing at the scorer's table when this happens. He runs, gets his key, unlocks his door, gets the thing out of the box, runs into the gym, into the locker room with that device. Can, can I tell you that God does some things behind the scenes that you don't even know what he's doing? But I thank God for Coach Augustine doing that and being persistent and getting it done so my boy can live. Don't, don't discount the little things. And let me tell you, don't discount the little things you're doing. What you're doing is setting the pace for the miraculous. What you do every day when you worship, when you're faithful, when you give, God is going to use that for somebody's miracle. God is setting the stage for the miraculous. Come on, I sense it. I sense it in this place. I sense it in this congregation. Your best days are ahead of you. What God's going to do in this place because you're working and you're praying and you're... Don't ever think that phone call doesn't matter. Don't ever think that that card doesn't matter. Don't ever think that, that, that shaking somebody's hand and loving somebody and praying for somebody doesn't matter. Because God is doing a backstory for the miraculous. That was February 4th a year ago. Last month, we had to go play the team again for this year. Noah's on the team, but he can't play because of that condition. Cardiologist wouldn't give him release to play, but he's still on the team. They made him a team captain. He sits there and he supports him and cheers him and all of that. We go back to Southern Lab a few weeks ago. Coach and Noah and myself, we walk into that locker room and we stand on that spot where he lay a year ago. A year ago, he lay there. A year later, he's standing. Come on. <laughs> and the last little thing, the little cherry on top. As I said, he couldn't play. It was a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, had a senior night. And coach told him, dress out. And already the school had given permission. We, I didn't tell him, but they'd already worked it out. And nobody told him, the coach didn't tell him, although someone may have clued him in a little bit, I don't know. But So he gets dressed, and he's sitting there. They introduce him as a starter. And he runs out on the court with the team, starts the game. Standing there, jump ball. I think uh, the other team got possession, went and shot and missed. We got possession, we've got possession, we're going down. Noah posts up over on the side on three-point, takes the ball, shoots, makes the first bucket of the game with three-pointer. And the crowd went wild. And then, and then they had to take him out of the game. But I'm telling you, the smile that was on his face of all the stuff he'd went through, it was like, it's like the, the perfect ending of that whole thing. But I tell you, I want to thank God I thank God that somehow he can help us even when we can't help ourselves and even when we can't believe like we want to believe and even though we struggle. God is for you. He's not against you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to be faithful to you. You have a covenant and he will not forget his covenant. You might forget it, but he won't forget it. You belong to God. I said, you belong to God. Stand with me, everybody. Stand, let's worship him a moment. Would you worship God a moment? Would you praise God a moment? Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ha, Lord 
Jesus, Jesus, we praise you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we praise you. Oh, God, we worship you in this place. Touch all these children. Touch all these young people. Touch all these moms and dads, all these single adults. God, I pray the touch and anointing of God upon every person in this building and that our faith would be stoked. So now here you are. Here I am again. And in the midst of your unbelief, God is moving. He sees you. He hasn't forsaken you. Faith brought you here today. Hear me. Faith brought you here. You know how I know that? You wouldn't be here if you didn't have some degree of faith. Faith brought you here. But you walked in, and you may have had a hard time dealing with situations in your life. But he is saying to you, believe. Because I have compassion and I will help you. So now you need to bring your faith, that little bit of faith to God. And say, God, help me. If you're facing a mountain, if you're facing a great problem in your life, Jesus is here to help you right now. So I want you to lift your hands high. And as you lift your hands, I want you to lift your head and I want you to lift your voice. And I want you to begin praising God right now. I want you to praise God for your miracle. I want you to praise God for your miracle. I want you to praise God for what he's going to do in your life right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, let it be throughout this house, throughout this building, the miraculous, the miraculous in your life. Come on, my sister. Come on, my brother. Woo! Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He's helping somebody's unbelief right now. He's helping your unbelief right now. He's helping you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Woo! Hallelujah. There ought to be somebody. You're in great travail. You've got a great problem. It's all right. You ought to come up here right now and just lift your hand and say, God, I believe you for deliverance. I believe you for help. I believe you for strength. I believe you for healing. I believe you for salvation. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you ought to walk up here this morning and say, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. It's for you. You ought to leave, not leave here without being filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. Come on, bring it to him. 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 Bring it to God. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. Come on, mom. Come on, dad. Give it to Jesus. Let God fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Come on, let's make this place an altar. If you would, find a place to pray. Find a place to pray. God, I believe. I trust you. God, I know you're going to work it out. I know you're going to heal. I know you're going to deliver. I know you're going to provide. I know you're going to make a way. In the name of Jesus. God, I give it over to you right now. Every worry, every fear, every dread, every problem. I give it over to you right now. God, I believe you're going to make a way. Even where there seems to be no way. God, I believe you're going to open the doors that need to be open. And you're going to close the doors that need to be closed. Oh, yes, Lord. I'm saying yes today. I'm saying yes to ministry. I'm saying yes to callings. I'm saying yes to anointings. I'm saying yes, oh God, to revival. I'm saying yes, oh God. Oh, come on. Somebody cry out to him. I need you, Lord. I don't want to leave here the same as I came. I need a miracle.
I tell you what, right now would be a great time for you to raise your hands and just worship the Lord. God, I thank you for what you've done in this room. God, I thank you for what you're doing in my heart. I thank you for what you're doing in my soul. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Hallelujah. 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 God, I pray for Sister Tony where she is right now. Lord, move in her body. Strengthen her. Help her. God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God touch Sister Luana Baker. Touch her. Come on, that's all right. That's all right. God's not done. Yeah. 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 Would you just pray for yourself right now? God, I pray, God, for a greater faith than I've ever had before. God, I speak peace over any kind of troubled soul or troubled spirit. God, I thank you for working even behind the scenes. I thank you because I know you're working for my good right now. In Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord right now? Did you enjoy Brother Martin? Wasn't that fantastic? I know he had another message that he was going to preach. Aren't you glad that God can speak to men? And Because that was just fantastic. That was fantastic. You know what? I... I want to bless them today. 